Hello everyone. Um, in today's lecture, we are going to talk about transmission electron microscopes and uh, get some idea about um, what is the optics uh, behind the transmission electron microscopes, uh, microscope, uh, what the electron column looks like. Uh, we are going to compare that to the uh, scanning electron microscope that we have studied in great details and uh, we will identify some of the similarities and uh, some of the differences and also um, how the operation is uh, controlled by various aspects of the um, computer mechanism, right? So if you look at the general components of the transmission electron microscope, uh, you, you will still find electron gun, obviously, because that's your emitter. There will be electromagnetic lenses, and uh, which also includes a condenser lens or maybe an array of condenser lenses, and uh, also multiple objective lenses, and we'll talk about that. Um, there are detectors, of course, um, and uh, also you will have a, a specimen holder, uh, which is very different from a scanning electron microscope uh, um, sample holder, and we will see what the differences are. So the primary modes of operation of uh, TEM are either in the parallel beam mode or the convergent beam mode, right? And depend that and which mode you're going to use depends on what you are trying to do with the uh, well, with the specimen and what is your interest in in that particular investigation, right? So if you want to do a transmission electron uh, microscope image um, of a sample, then you would use a parallel beam. Um, whereas if you are doing a what is called scanning transmission electron microscopy, you would need a convergent beam. Um, also, any kind of X-ray analysis that you want to do with the TEM, you would you would rely on the convergent beam beam mode, right? And then there are various other kind of measurements you can do uh, and investigations um, using the convergent beam, and we'll get into the details, right? So basically, um, if you look at the TEM under the parallel beam mode. The ray optics looks like this, and this is the ray. This is the uh, the, the ray optics as it looks um, above the specimen, right? So there's a, there's going to be again light that or electron that transmits through the specimen as the as the technique itself tells you it's a transmission electron microscopy. Um, so let's take a look at what the ray, what the optics is like um, before the electron uh, beam interacts with the specimen. So you have your gun and you have the crossover point, right? And this is your first condenser lens, this is your second condenser lens, and then you have an upper objective lens, right? So the first condenser lens um, creates an image of the gun crossover, so that's your condenser lens crossover over there. And then you have an aperture here, which is not shown, but you essentially limit the electrons that you want in the, in the cone or the solid cone of your interest. That light is again uh, converged through a, a C2, which is your second condenser lens. Um, it, then it goes past your first or the fo front focal plane, um, then through the upper objective lens, uh, and then you make sure that that is at the focal plane of the upper objective lens so that you end up getting a parallel beam of electrons. Now, parallel beam of electrons are, are very, very important. Uh, if you are trying to look at what is called a selected area diffraction pattern or uh, also called SAD. Um, we'll get into the details of what this is, but essentially what you, I want you to retain right now is that you need to have a parallel, you need to use the electron microscope in the parallel mode, parallel beam mode, uh, in order to do um, SAED uh, or SAD um, measurements, okay? Um, the convergent beam mode is, is quite commonly used as well and it is used especially in transmission, uh, scanning transmission electron microscopy which is a combination of the SEM and the TEM techniques. Um, there are several advantages to have uh, and this is really a powerful technique. Um, we will get into the details of this uh, um, maybe in the next lecture. But uh, just, just for you to know that you, you need the convergent beam mode. Let's take a look at the ray optics. Uh, you have, um, if you have a FEG source, which is a field emission gun, then you do not need too many um, lenses to, to get the focus and the probe spot that you want. Uh, typically, your probe diameter in case of a TEM is less than a nanometer. So you have a first condenser lens, uh, you have a C2 diaphragm or also call it C2 aperture, 
which is associated with your second condenser lens. And essentially, you just focus everything onto your sample into a tight spot. Because this is a field effect uh, gun, um, the beam diameter beginning at the gun crossover itself is very small. So the demagnification is not uh, tremendous in this case. So a couple of lenses are able to handle it. Um, you can use this for various modes and various operations, for example, OG electron microscopy, uh, X-ray analysis, uh, CEBD, which stands for convergent electron beam uh, diffraction. Then you have the high ang angle annular dark field imaging, HAADF, and then electron energy loss spectroscopy. So all these modes can be uh, there along with your TEM with, uh, with the basic diffraction and imaging modes. Uh, and if you were to use, if you were to do these investigations, you would need a convergent beam mode, um, right? Now, if you were using a thermionic source and you still wanted to do a convergent beam mode measurement, then the optics would be slightly different in that column. You would have another lens, which is your C3, right? And the C2 lens is turned off, but there is a C2 uh, diaphragm or aperture which is important in determining the convergence angle that you that that is uh, um, incident on the on the specimen. So you still have your gun and C1 lens. There's a diaphragm here or or an aperture which limits the solid angle uh, that you're collecting or letting pass through, right? <clears throat> and then then the C3 lens focuses everything into a tight spot, and typically you get less than a nanometer here as well, right? But as you will, as you all understand now, um, uh, that in case of a thermionic source, the demagnification has to be tremendous, which is why you have uh, more number of lenses in the optical column. And uh, similar to the SEM, you have a condenser objective lens combination that determines the spot size and the probe size. So, as as we have seen for SEMs, the condenser lens strength lens strength. Uh, plays a very important role in the probe diameter, right? So, so you can see here, this is a strong condenser lens versus a weak condenser lens. So the excluded electrons and the solid angles and the cones that are generated are different. Uh, and that determines the final probe diameter uh, on the specimen and also the uh, probe current that the specimen experiences, right? So, so far we have seen everything above the specimen, right? And the final thing is um, the translation and tilting of the beam. So if you were using the STEM mode, um, obviously you need to scan across the sample, right? As the name suggests, you need to do the scanning part of the electron microscopy. So you need a bunch of uh, scan coils that, that determine the, 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 the tilt, uh, that determine the motion of the beam. Uh, with on, on, with respect to the optic axis on the specimen, right? And the scan coils, they basically um, generate an, a magnetic field that tilts the, the, the downward path of the electrons. Um, and so the, the, the point of impact on the specimen changes uh, when, you, when you turn on the current in your scan coils, right? So the C2 aperture that we saw here in this image that is very important uh, in, in many ways because that actually allows you that the location of the C2 aperture in the, along the optical path um, helps you as a user um, um, get good images. It helps you in collimating and uh, not collimating, but aligning the, the electron beam. So typically, um, the, the alignment of the C, C2 aperture can be done by a process called wobbling. Um, so, so take a look at this. this. This yellow disc here signifies your viewing screen, right? And the optic axis is right dead center, which is by the given by the crosshair over here. Um, if your C2 aperture is not per perfectly aligned along the optic axis, you're going to end up seeing distorted images which are off axis, right? So what you want to do is turn on the wobbling mode uh, what this does is it, it applies an AC current to your electromagnetic lenses, um, which is your condenser lens. And that AC current uh, oscillates the, 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 the magnetic field of the condenser lens uh, by a very small amount, which is sufficient to throw the image off 
uh, its focus, right? So you, you're going in and out of focus by changing the strength of the condenser lens. So, so how you would do it is you would try to bring the image or the sample to the best focus you can in, in, in your, on your computer screen or on the, on the viewing screen of the transmission electron microscope. And then you're going to turn on the wobbler. And because you have that extra AC field that is uh, being applied to the um, condenser lens, the sample or, or, the, or the image that you are observing is going to go in and out of focus. And when that is happening, if your image is, uh, is, is moving away from the optic axis or there is some, some translation, that means your C2 aperture is not properly aligned to the optic axis. So you can, you can uh, use a, um, uh, computer control stages to, to, to change the position of the C2 aperture in the older models, you would have to do that manually. Uh, that depends on what kind of electron microscope you encounter. But the point is, you, you, you change the location of the C2 aperture. These are very minute changes in the order of less than a few microns uh, or even less. Um, and essentially what you want is, you want your optic axis, which is obviously in the center of the viewing screen. And as you go in and out of that focus in, in, in the wobbling mode, um, you basically see the, the image going out of focus. Uh, that means it's getting bigger, right? So that's your defocused beam. So you're basically looking at the, the, the image of the beam itself, um, which is going out of focus. But when it is doing that, it is not translating in any direction. If it is translating, that means you, have, you, you haven't aligned it well enough. So you're back to this situation. So you need to change the location of your C2 aperture to make sure that that your C2 aperture is perfectly aligned. And, and this is very, 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 very important because um, you are trying to look at atoms using transmission electron microscope. So if your alignment to start with is not correct, you will not be able to do it. And you're trying to do sub nanometer angstrom order measurements. So these are highly, highly sensitive measurements. Obviously, you need to make sure that your alignment is correct. The other form of defect that you can encounter, and, and we have spoken about these uh, uh, various aberrations, um, like the spherical aberration, the chromatic or astigmatism, um, it, while we were looking at scanning electron microscopes, um, the same mathematical principles apply here as well. You have the same expressions for quantifying the spherical aberration, the chromatic aberration, right? Um, and essentially, like for example, if you have astigmatism, um, you're going to see these uh, um, distorted under focus or over focus beam uh, profiles essentially you should see a perfect circle right so so you can uh, use uh, coils to correct for these um, kind of defects but but most uh, most most transmission electron microscopes the modern ones will be will will enable you to do it um, so so these are things you need to look out for as a user when you're trying to uh, image using the TEM, right? And then you have the objective lens and the stage, which, which, which is the core of the TEM. Um, the, the, this is where the TEM starts to become very different from the SEM, because in, in case of the SEM, in most cases, we were using pinhole uh, uh, um, lenses. So your sample was outside the, um, the, the, the electromagnetic lens itself. But here you will see that the sample is actually inside the electromagnetic lens. So we are going to be using, or, or the most commonly used lenses in case of TEM are uh, the immersion lenses, right? And, and the other, dif the, 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 the most important difference, and, and, I, and I want this to, and I want to emphasize on this, is that the, the distance between the sample and the stage, or the lens and the stage, is, is not changed at all that is fixed, that is given. So you have the same objective lens current, you have the same objective lens magnification in a DEM. So, the, so, so there is no concept of working distance here, like we saw in scanning electron microscopes. Uh, in most scanning electron microscopes, again, the, 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 the kind of lenses are the pinhole lenses, so your sample is outside the electromagnetic lens. So as a user, you have control in determining the, the, the distance between the lens to your to your sample specimen um, which is the working distance and that in turn gives you control of the 
of the field of view and magnification and so on and so forth but that that is not available in TEM uh, precisely because you want to minimize any kind of aberration and any kind of uh, defects that are there in the pinhole lens uh, which are not there in the immersion lens. Right? So typically, as I said, the, the specimen is, is in an immersion lens. Right? So typically the sample holder looks something like this. So you have, um, you have a, a, a barrel Basically, you, as a user, you hold this end of the sample holder, and then you 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 gently push it into the electron column, uh, which is also called. This is um, uh, this is typically the arrangement for a side entry holder, right? Um, and then you have the specimen which is sitting at the tip of the holder itself, uh, and then there is a mechanical part called the jewel bearing, and we'll talk about that in the next slide. Uh, essentially, you have a cup where which holds the specimen uh, the specimen is typically on a copper grid or or uh, if it's a thin film sample then you have spe special holders for um, mounting the thin film samples on or, or, or on, on the on the holder itself right um, and then the the angle of the holder with respect to the electron column is also important so these holders can be corrected for any tilt in the x y or z directions uh, using a goniometer stage. So a typical holder looks something like this. Um, if, if you were to look only in the green region here, you would see something like this. Uh, this is a multiple sample uh, holder. This is, these are not very common. Commonly you would encounter something like this. So you have your cup, which is about three millimeters, right? And three millimeters in diameter. So if you consider this as three millimeters along the diameter, you can get an estimate of how big each of these dimensions are, um, uh, a rough estimate. And then depending on what kind of measurement you want to do, there are various types of holders. Uh, and and uh, in reality, you can just study the different kind of holders and all the, uh, like for example, you have uh, cryo holders, you have uh, holders for uh, other measurements. Uh, you can you can mount up to five samples in given holders. There are in situ holders, um, which are which are very different from uh, in terms of their functionality. But the bottom line is that uh, you you have the sample which is very small, and the hold and the sample cup comes with a hole, so the electron beam goes right through that hole, right? Uh, and then here you can see uh, this is probably mounted with a copper grid, uh, and these copper grids are basically a mesh, a copper mesh which has a layer of carbon on top. Uh, the carbon is, 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 is almost transparent to the electron uh, uh, beam. So you can put your sample on top and then you can shine the electron beam right through it to do the imaging um, that you desire, right? So, so far, this is all up to, the, up to this point. We have looked at light coming from the electron gun onto the sample. Now the or light or electrons, right? So now the electron is going to go from the sample down to the detector or your viewing plate, right? So here, the, there are two different modes of operation again. You have the diffraction mode and you have the imaging mode. And, and you can control as a user in which mode you want to use. Uh, for example, if you wanted to see diffraction patterns, obviously, as the name suggests, you would just look at, go, you would choose the diffraction mode. But if you want to image, then you would choose the image mode. Right? So there is a side-by-side -side comparison here of the diffraction mode and the imaging mode. Uh, this is your specimen. So, so far we were talking about all the different optics above the specimen. Now let's focus on the optics below the specimen. So below the specimen, you have an objective lens. Right? You had an objective lens on the top as well. But now you have an objective lens here that is collecting the light that has transmitted or collecting the electrons that has transmitted through the specimen. Uh, the plane where the objective lens focuses is called the forward focal plane um, which is not shown here but you have a forward focal plane somewhere around here and then you have um, uh, two different apertures uh, that are used uh, that are used depending on which mode you are operating at so this is something I want you to pay attention you have an objective aperture right and then you have uh, SAD or the selective area diffraction aperture. So the objective aperture is always closer to the objective lens. Um, 
uh, and and if you were to use if you were to operate uh, in the diffraction mode then the objective aperture needs to be removed from the electron column but you keep the sad aperture but if you were to use it in an imaging mode then you would keep the objective aperture and remove the sad aperture right and that that uh, is important because uh, in the diffraction mode you are collecting selectively certain uh, areas of the electron beam uh, and then f and then uh, that is being projected onto your viewing screen uh, and in the image mode you are collecting again certain parts of the electron beam but you don't want to lose any any information once the beam has passed through the objective aperture the other contrasting difference between the two modes is the strength of the intermediate lens here so here you can see the intermediate strength is uh, the 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 lens uh, the the strength of the intermediate lens is a lot lower so your focal plane is much further away and and then you have them in in such a way that they focus right on the screen um, and the, as a user you are going to do those changes in the uh, lens strength to so that you can see these diffraction spots and patterns um and in this case you have a much stronger lens so so you 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 end up getting images um, on your on your viewing screen, right? Um, okay, so so once you are in the imaging mode, right? So we will discuss more about the diffraction mode, but before that, I want to talk about diffraction itself, and we'll do that when we meet in class physically. Um, in the imaging mode itself, there are you have either the bright field mode, the dark field mode, or the center dark field mode. Um, and that totally depends on the location of that aperture C2. Um, sorry, it depends on the location of your SAD aperture, right? So you have your specimen, the light is coming from top. Uh, in this case, uh, it, is, uh, um, it is being diffracted off the lattice planes, right? So a specific order of diffraction, let's say it's formed at a certain different spot on your, uh, uh, on, 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 and then you use the objective aperture, which is right here. You use the objective aperture and select which area you want to look at, right? In this case, if you keep the objective aperture exactly along the optic axis, then you're imaging with the direct beam. So that is called the bright field image. So you have your optic axis, which is the crosshair, you have the direct beam which is traveling along the optic axis because you as a user have made sure that you're properly aligned that was done using the aperture c2 um, and then you are also aligning the objective aperture along the optic axis so that you get a bright field image now if you were interested in only looking at the diffracted light the light that was diffracted from the atomic plane in that case what you would do is you would block off the direct beam so you still have your optic axis and the, uh, 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 and the direct beam, which is completely blocked off. But then you're positioning your objective aperture where you can only let or you will only allow light that has been diffracted off a certain specific plane to pass through. In that case, you're going to end up getting uh, a, a dark field image. The other option is you use the, 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 the tilt um, uh, and, and translation coils, right, uh, which are above the specimen, and you tilt the incident beam itself. In this case, uh, the beam is not coming along the optic axis, but at a certain angle, it's getting diffracted off the same lattice planes. It's creating uh, a diffracted beam, which is going down after the diffraction. Uh, and then the direct beam, which is always signified by the, the color in magenta, um, is formed at a, a different location and you place your objective aperture along the optic axis. So in this case, you have a diffracted beam you along the optic axis. Your direct beam is again blocked off, right? And then now you can see the center dark field image. Now, why is it important or why do we care about the direct beam? Uh, then that will become more apparent if you look at these images here. Uh, so if you were doing bright field images, you would end up getting always a bright spot in the center. That is, I'll, if this is an image taken on the viewing plate, um, so the center is always sort of super saturated or burnt out, um, which is a very colloquially used term, but 
But essentially that's happening because uh, all the direct beam that is being transmitted through the uh, specimen is, is falling onto the viewing plate. So that is this particular mode here. And obviously for various reasons, you may not want that because, um, because uh, you, you may lose information um, that, that is critical to you. Um, so these are all bright field images and you can see these really dark, bright spots in the center, which is from the direct beam over here. Um, so the way to the way about it, or uh, the roundabout, so that you do not see the direct beam is to do dark field imaging, which is where you move the objective aperture and then you end up getting really nice images. So this is a dark field image of strontium titanate. Um, you can see ex uh, explicitly each and every um, uh, atom uh, and, and then the contrast between the atoms depend, is generated by the atomic weight itself. And we'll talk about this um, um, later in, in the course. Um, so in the next class, we are going to talk about scanning transmission electron microscope, which is a combination of the, uh, of the scanning electron microscope and the transmission electron microscope. You get the best of the two worlds in that kind of a system. Those are significantly more expensive, um, but, but they, they have a lot of um, uh, excellent functionality. And, and we'll get to the details of that in the next video lecture.